Hello and welcome to our second session of Blue Table Talks. My name is Sherry Hubert. I'm the Associate Dean of Admissions here at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. I'm so excited to be back here with you and those of you who might be new to our Blue Table Talk session. Um, it is a series, this is our second series, a second session in the series where we try and share with you the student experience um, across a number of really important topics. And this, today's topic, will focus on the first generation experience. And I have with me three wonderful students who have taken time out of their busy schedule to join me to share their experience. And so what we're going to do is it's, a, it's you know, free flowing, it'll be a conversation. This particular topic is really important to me personally because I do identify as first generation. Um, I also identify as uh, low to middle um, income in terms of my socioeconomic background. I grew up primarily with my mom. And interestingly, for me, the way first generation showed up is that I was at a Jesuit school uh, in my, my freshman year in high school. And, uh, but we couldn't, I couldn't afford to stay there. So we moved away. I didn't stay there from my sophomore to, to uh, senior year, but I was still on their mailing list. And an alum of Dartmouth came to do an information session a college information session at the Jesuit high school. I still happened to be on their mailing list, and so I got privy to that information and decided to go ahead and attend that session. And that's how I got exposed to a school such as Dartmouth, and that's how I ended up coming, going to Dartmouth. And you'll, you'll learn me and I have Dartmouth in common, so that's how I got exposed to Dartmouth. Um, and it really, uh, being open to the unfamiliar, um, connecting with individuals that I may not have known, uh, really, you know, was life changing, right? Um, it was a kind of experience that was truly life changing and created a lot more possibility in my life than perhaps I might have might have had, uh, be, you know, uh, otherwise. So that's just kind of my story. I want to dig into each of your stories because I think they're very unique. So that's where we're going to start. I hope you enjoy the session. In order to start, I'd love for the audience to just to quickly get to know who we are. So Mia and Ashlyn and Gary, do you want to quickly introduce yourselves and then we can get dip deeper into your experiences? Sounds good. My name is Mia Liko. I'm from Connecticut and I was a Dartmouth undergrad, fellow alum. Um, I studied government and I'm now pursuing a master's in management at Fuqua. Um, I'm an admissions ambassador and I'm on the Duke swim team as well. Hi everyone, my name is Ashlyn Polanco. I'm a current second year in the daytime MBA Fuqua program. Um, I am very excited to be here. I am both the co-president of a club called Life, which is a new club for those who have a low income socioeconomic background or and first generation uh, college student and now master's student. Um, so as well as a plethora of other clubs that yeah, I am involved. happy but I to go into. Um, very much involved. So I'll pass it on to Gary. Are you a cabinet member? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Gary. I'm originally from Texas. I uh, went to undergrad there and then I commissioned from the RTC program there and served the last seven years in the Army, uh, which took me all over from Georgia, Arizona, New York, most recently North Carolina, but also overseas a couple of times. Uh, so I'm in the daytime MBA program here at Fuqua and also very involved. I am my section uh, representative, uh, so get to lead a cabinet and then on two different cabinets of, of life and then the Association of Women in Business as an ally cabinet member, so uh, enjoying all of those experiences as well. Oh, great, great. So um, we're going to use LIFE. LIFE stands for Low Income First Generation Experience um, as, as an identity, right? Um, and, you know, Forgive me, I'm going to need my, my readers. <laughs> you each have identified, at least as first generation. My question to you is, do you also identify, we talked about this a little bit beforehand, do you also identify as coming from a low-income socioeconomic background as well? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to ask you, and maybe, you know, me, you can start, just describe or share with us your lived experience, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, how, the way in which you identify as, as life, how does that, how did that influence um, your upbringing, your lived experience, and then your reasoning for wanting to pursue your business degree. Yeah, so my parents actually came here in 1999 to America. 
um, and they sort of fled war um, back in Croatia and Bosnia during that time. Um, so they came here, and I was born in 2000, so first generation um, American as well mm -hmm, in some yeah. sense. Um, but they've truly taught me to like take advantage of all opportunities that come my way because of what they've been through and what they haven't really gotten to experience. Um, so yeah, that's a huge part of my upbringing. Um, they always told me to go for it. I went to Dartmouth undergrad and they were my main supporters for um, this dream to sort of pursue business school. Mm -hmm. How did you learn? How did you learn about Dartmouth? You heard my story about um, through recruiting with swimming. So okay. I, as mm -hmm. I mentioned, I'm a swimmer. I would have no idea about <laughs> Dartmouth. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't really know, you know, about the Ivy League um, and that whole education. And so definitely being a part of this whole swimming community. Mm -hmm. And seeing the people who I swam with who are a little older than me go through the process really helped. Mm -hmm. um, so then I was recruited, um, which was cool. Yeah. So that was that's wonderful. Cool. Ashley, what about you? What's your story? Uh, yeah, so um, I my mother was an immigrant, similarly from Nicaragua. She came fleeing the Nicaraguan Revolution. Um, she actually came to this country undocumented, so she entered through the U.S. southern border um, with Coyote. And so it was a really, and she came with a baby, like my brother, who was okay. one at the time. Um, and I'm US born, so, but that has obviously impacted the opportunities that my mom has been granted uh, in life. And so she worked in a factory my whole life while I was growing, or like as a waitress or as a maid. Um, I grew up in a single parent home and she would work from second shift. So I would come home and she wouldn't be that she wasn't there from four until midnight and I in a lot of ways had to raise myself mm -hmm. um, so from a very young age I just became very independent uh, yet still really striving in school and academics was like my I guess my out um, and I knew that based off of this experience like I and I wanted like life uh, a lot of the times you are born into this systemically you will be impacted from the moment you are born mm -hmm. what communities you live in what schools you attend, what education, and to your point, who recruits you? Mm -hmm. Like, you're not gonna get recruited by people like this if you're not going to good high schools or good colleges. Um, so I went to an in-state school in South Carolina. It was public. Uh, it was good, I got a full ride, but it was also like, you don't have the same opportunities like a Duke undergrad would. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went into nonprofit work right after uh, because that was the only thing I figured was right like I was like oh I know this I, I identified this way I want to make the world better for other people um, and again not having people in my network not lacking the social capital to understand that there's other opportunities out there that I should maybe like I could pursue something else like the only thing I knew was what I knew which is what I lived mm -hmm. um, I didn't have the mentorship in my life to really steer me in different directions and so all the opportunities I took were just things that made sense to me um, but yet, yeah, very happy. I spent the last six and a half years in Washington, D.C., working in a variety of different nonprofit organizations, um, and I believe really creating access and pipelines for people that I look like me or have similar feelings to me. And I think that's transcended to my time here at Fuqua as well and will continue into my career and is something I'm pursuing mm -hmm. post uh, MBA. And I'm going to ask you the same similar question. Um, how did you find Fuqua, how did you decide the MBA? Um, yeah, so my last job, my I would say my like mentor was my CEO of the organization, and this organization worked to, uh, we did DEI consulting, so um, she came from Harvard Business School, she was an alum there, so she was the one that really kind of told me, it was the first time I had access to anybody that pursued an MBA. Mm -hmm. And I realized like the amazing opportunities that she was like, that network gave her when she opened and founded this organization, how she was able to get some of her first grants because of this network. Um, and so as opposed to like kind of being like, oh, should I go to law school? Should I go to public policy school? And then it kind of like honed in on, I needed to reach economic mobility. I have mm -hmm. to retire my mom. Like my mom can't, she's working at a factory still. She wakes up at 5 a.m. and she's yeah. like, her health is really depleting. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, I am my mom's retirement. I am my own. Like I can't make like this much money my whole life. So since I knew I had to pursue yeah. um, something different and that's when I decided to pursue an MBA. 
And for me, Duke was honestly not really, or FICO wasn't really on my radar because I was looking predominantly at consortium schools mm -hmm. because I knew they would offer full ride opportunities. Um, but I got a free application waiver and I applied and I was granted the K scholarship, which gave me a full ride tuition to come to FICO for two years. Um, but yeah, that was basically what ended up happening. So yeah. it was, and it was close. My mom's in South Carolina, so I wanted to be close to my mom. Yeah, yeah. And I'm asking the origin story because that's always the challenge, right? It's always like, well, how, how do you know, right? How do you find, how did you get connected? How did, what was the insight? What was, who was the role model? Like, what was it that was that spark that first said, okay, I can do this, or this opportunity, I'm now exposed to this opportunity, whereas before I perhaps were, was not. Gary, what's your story? Yeah, so I, I wanna, I think, highlight a couple things that Ashlyn said that I can very much relate to, and the first one is, you know, I think I struggled with what what is a mentor and, and where do we get mentors from and how do you go about, you know, developing that relationship, but also not knowing what's out there because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, what's been a part of my story now as I am going to these various recruiting events is, well, you know, I decided on the MBA because my family doesn't have a professional background and so I have no idea what's going, going on out there. Um, plus coming from the military, like the military is a very, uh, you know, insular place. You, you live, live and breathe it. Mm -hmm. um, so just wanted to call that back out because I think it's really important. Uh, it's one of the, the gaps and the challenges. But I, uh, my, my background, my story, uh, I think it could be best described as unstructured as a kid. You know, just not a lot of uh, support systems in the way. Didn't have, um, you know, a great home life uh, in a, a few various ways. I have two older sisters and, and my parents are divorced. I live primarily with, with my mom. They both challenged with, you know, very, were, uh, both had challenges with various addiction issues and, and just employment issues and stuff like that. And so I remember my oldest sister is about nine years older than me when she was 15, 16 years old working and having to pay, you know, part of the bills just so we could do these things. Um, and so that, my uh, unstructured lifestyle, I think existed all the way through high school. I knew I wanted to join the army from a very young age. Mm -hmm. And so that's just what I was going to do. I was gonna go enlist in the army and I'm a, uh, to a fault an avid researcher and so I was like oh well if, what am I gonna do in the army oh you can be an officer in the army how to be an officer uh, and you know okay you have to go to college I was like, okay I decided you know on that point I was gonna gonna go to college but that was halfway through my senior year of high school and so I had done no preparation and so I, I went and I applied to the one school that was still accepting applications there was no you know reach out for me there wasn't anything else I, I went and took the SAT without any studying and you know, thankfully uh, countered my, my low GPA from high school and was able to get in and, and participate mm -hmm. in their ROTC program. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. And, you know, it's, it's difficult, I think, to remember, remember that and like to give myself a little bit of grace. Um, right. Because, you know, I had six months to prepare for this transition to college when no one had gone. And, and even to this point, there's, there still hasn't been anyone else in my family that's gone to college. And so it's it's challenging to to remember that as as I talk to uh, talk to others about my experience and, and some of the, the gaps that that may have caused. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, it, you guys give me chills because I can relate to a yeah. lot of your you know. Like my mom decided to become a living nanny to support me to go to Dartmouth, right? And you know I was again home alone and you know but just but but scrappy and I think there's a lot of perseverance there's a lot of oh, like yeah. resourcefulness here that in this in your stories that I hear right and I think um, and also this notion of wanting to do something different or create a, a different kind of um, path in order to then support or to be able to to show our parents right, right. that we are really appreciative of the sacrifices that they've that they've made to allow us to get to where we are um, you mentioned a little bit, you touched on this a little bit, you don't know what you don't know, right? right. And so um, as a first-gen student, we don't know what we don't know. Um, but what would have been uh, more helpful to you to know during the application process, um, any examples of how you um, either created the opportunities or found uh, resources? Um, you talked about your mentor, the, the person you reported into. Any other examples of, you know, how you went about the application process knowing that you didn't know what you didn't know and you ne didn't necessarily have your parents to rely on to talk to you about the path forward. 
But I think now, and I, I wish I would have known it when I was applying, but the fact that you know the Life Club does exist here, I can promise you, you know, that anyone can reach out to any member of the Life Club, uh, or even just call anyone here at Pukul and say, "Can you give me a point of contact?" and you know, you'll you'll get a response, and, and mm -hmm. you know, any of us are happy to talk to it. I luckily knew that the the Veterans Club existed, um, but I think the biggest way to help figure out you know what what these things are and how to go about them is is by connecting with people that came from where you did. You know, for me it, at the time it was the Veterans Network that I was able to rely on and ask the craziest questions to because I really didn't know. And and you know now as as life is is here and it stood up and it's ever present that's another resource for people to reach out I think it's the best resource that uh, potential applicants have mm -hmm. yeah any anything else to add um, oh, I would say yeah this intersectionality was helpful there I leaned into the black and Latinx network here um, similarly life was kind of gearing up at that point they were getting their charter put in place um, but now we have some very exciting initiatives to get to help more prospective students and finding ways to, you know, support you through your admissions uh, journey because we know it could be a very lonely experience. I personally, not just coming from life, but kind of like the intersectionality of being like a woman, Latina, life, and coming from a non-traditional background. Mm -hmm. It was it was terrible. Like it was just like I was like, oh, I'm not gonna ever get in anywhere. Like I. Didn't even my joke. I don't know what I didn't know what a profit was when I like started it. I had no idea. Um, so I think it was just just understanding that there's other people like you, but also other people here to support you and to like mm -hmm. enable you to feel like you are brilliant and deserving of being in these spaces. Actually, not more than anyone else, but just as much as anyone yes, else. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I would go along. I know we mentioned this before. It started, but even that question on the application, um, are you a first generation student? I think that like meant a lot, um, knowing that, you know, Fuqua Care is um, if you identify as a first generation and there's a place for you at Fuqua, which was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So I know um, in addition to just this notion of finding belonging and, and f feeling that this is a possibility that's in reach, financially is, is, is another big consideration, right? Can you financially afford to um, pursue your business degree? So talk to us a little bit about the either, you know, either academic or financial resources that you may have you know, availed yourself of throughout the process. So I was very lucky enough to have the, the GI Bill um, mm. and, and do that. And, and so, you know, the military is always a great kind of way to, to get that, but, but mm -hmm. I know a lot of people don't, but on the academic resources, I mean, I, I've truly been so amazed by um, how nice the professors are. <laughs> to the extent of like, you know, you said you didn't know what a profit was. I legitimately bombed my first stats quiz because <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I just like mis miscalculated like what that meant or what it should mean, mm -hmm. and and you know, my stats professor like sending him an email, him replying back in, in just a few minutes, and then getting on a Zoom call with me. Right? Like I, I didn't have professors that did that during during my undergrad years, and and then same thing, you know, down the line, I, I struggled with a couple of questions in economics, and mm -hmm. sent the professor an email, and he called my cell phone, and he said, "Can you talk through an hour of the phone?" I was like, "Yeah." And so, you know, there's there's never a reason to worry about how you're going to do academically at a place like Fuqua because the people that are here, whether it's your peers or the professors, like they're going to take the time to teach you what you need to be taught and show you different methods of getting there. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, you talked a little bit about the scholarships you received, and so I'll come back. Mm -hmm. Mia, you're in a unique situation in terms of being a student athlete, so talk mm -hmm. about that and how that has been beneficial in your ability to afford either undergrad or in there, and therefore now. Yeah, so without the scholarship, there's no way I think I would be able to sort of be here so it was a combination of Fuqua's merit-based scholarship as well as the athletic scholarship that has sort of allowed me to be here, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, yeah. Any other academic resources that you have taken advantage of or find that would be helpful? Um, academic, well, just as Gary mentioned, I mean, the professors have been awesome um, and they will 
stay after class, go before class. Like, mm -hmm. there's really, you would have to try to fail, I think. <laughs> um, because, yeah, and same as in Dartmouth, I think that's sort of what I expected coming here. So mm -hmm. it's been awesome. And then Ashley, you mentioned that you got a full tuition scholarship. Yes, mm -hmm. I did get a full tuition scholarship. Um, I've heard from a lot of my peers that also there's like good financial aid packages, packages outside of getting this like kind of unique path. But case scholarship is for those uh, who demonstrated um, a, de de a commitment, love, commitment, to, like, commitment social to social impact, social impact yeah. previously and are committed to continuing social impact some way in their career. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, my way into that is through keeping D, like a lot of it's doubling down on my DEI uh, mm -hmm. efforts. but. I think also, like, I did come from nonprofit world, and I want to be very clear, that does not make a lot of money. Um, and so I was applying during COVID, and, like, we couldn't do anything. So that helped me save a lot of money, which is really supportive because I had, like, a good amount of money to get me through my first year here because the cost of living. I also, like, made sure that when I was strategically looking at MBA programs that I was choosing schools that weren't in big cities. And that was a very strategic reason why. Like, I did not choose New York, I did not choose Chicago, and I did not choose LA. And I think that was a conscious decision on my part to because I knew cost of living was going to be an added expense. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think there's ways that you can like approach these decisions in a way that's methodical, methodological, whatever methodological. Um, but also ensuring that like you're, I had to have those conversations with my mom and my family and be like, I cannot support in any way, shape or form for two years. Um, and it was scary. Like my mom's always been very supportive. She's like, it's okay. But I was like, I was sending her hundreds of dollars a month. And like, I was like, but I know that there's a reason for me doing this. And mm -hmm. as of recently, like I've gotten, um, like to be offered like a, a role, at, like a full-time opportunity that's going to be four times what I was making prior to business school is life -changing. it's life changing. It's gonna be life changing for me and my family. Mm -hmm. And I knew that it's just like in the short term it's very scary. Yeah. And it's terrifying to take on something like this. And like I think that's what I wanna like and it's definitely possible, but it's and there's spectrums of what you have to do when you're here. Like you don't have to do everything. You don't mm -hmm. have to do all the trips, all the events. You'll find people that are like different parts and like that's okay but also you shouldn't feel guilty of taking those opportunities upon yourself to be like I want to travel I want to take advantage of what I'm getting granted for two years and that is something we constantly have to tell and share within our life groups and we do that in our in our life club to support each other and like there's a lot of mental hurdles that we mm -hmm. like we can talk about financial we can talk about this but there's a lot of mental hurdles right. that we have to overcome and coming from this identity group and like oftentimes don't get to share. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's been the financial aspect of it. And um, academically, I would double down on everything that Gary said. The professors have been incredible. Um, I failed so many things. <laughs> and like, I would literally like go to have weekly, my stats professor also, we would just have weekly Zoom calls together like outside of his yeah. hours because he's like, you need, do you want more time? I was like, yes, and we would do it. And so peers as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's some of the things the themes that I'm hearing are um, being very intentional in in making choices, right? And also this notion of not necessarily just needing to think about being able to finance it yourself for your own ability to live and to you know, but but the fact that you also have responsibilities that continue and persist throughout your program that are responsibilities that are familial, right? You still have family members sometimes that many of us have to still take care of um, or siblings I've heard that as well right and so it's not just thinking about can I afford this for myself but knowing that I also still have these responsibilities at the same time that I have to continue to be accountable for um, and can I add on one more yeah, thing? Yeah, go ahead. So I just wanted to, I, I think the common, like a common thread here, at least with us three and many others, is, is that, that low income side of it. And because of this identity, like the money is always at the forefront of our minds. Like it's, it's, it's woven into like every decision that we make. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just want to like put a rose on it and say like, if it's a, if it's ever a concern for anyone else, uh, like, it's possible and that's I think that's the biggest thing like scholarship GI Bill or anything else there are what I had to continue telling myself to get over these mental hurdles is that there's 
hundreds and hundreds of people that are doing it every single year. And so if why they're not doing you? it every single year, That's right. obviously the return on investment, you know, what you're going to be getting afterwards, the, the four times, mm -hmm. like it's, it's going to pay off. Right. And so don't, don't let the fear of it and that, that m idea of money always being at our, the forefront of our mind ever keep you from, from being at a, a program that's going to make you happy and make your life better in the future. Oh, Gary. Okay. Case closed. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> You're the, you, that, that's exactly right. Right. Um, so you touched it off family. I want to, I want to dig a little deeper into the familial component here because it is very important. And not only is it a mental hurdle to just for yourself to believe that this is possible for you and that you deserve this and you know, but you also sometimes have to convince your family, right? So talk to us a little bit about were there any family pressures that came along um, with the identity and um, you know, how did your family respond to your dreams of wanting to pursue your business degree? Anyone can start. All right, I think I got the Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, right, right. Do I remember um, you from the family. So yeah. <laughs> I'll go after. Um, so, you know, at, one of the things that I think is also interesting about the identity is is that there is this theme that you know, for many, if you're a low income or first generation, that they still have that very strong like tie to their family. I feel like I personally miss out on that. Like I'm I'm not close to my family for a few different reasons. I think school is has been something that has in some ways driven a, a wedge between my family and I because it just mm. created so much separation between us. And I think in some ways, like some resentment from my family. Um, and so, it, you know, there's an aspect of it that, you know, is is not fun with that, but still going back to everything else, peers and, and professors, the support that you get is, mm -hmm. is still worth it. But the family tie for me is I have a four-year-old son and, mm -hmm. and going back to the financials and the commitments that you have, I was yeah. like, you know, happiest and, and scariest day of my life when I got accepted because it's like, okay, well, this is great, amazing, I did it. And I was like, oh, well, daycare's still expensive. Right. And like, he still he gets new clothes like every three or four months because he's growing so fast. And talking it through with his mom on like how this was gonna go and, and, and we're not together anymore. And so there's that aspect of it as well, where it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well now I'm leaving the military where I'm making money and there's still all of these obligations. And so it's just taking that, that uh, you know, having those conversations and having them like, you know, same thing with, with the money, like this will be something that makes it better in the future. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna, we're gonna go forward and do it. And being committed to not stepping away from the responsibilities that you do have, which I think, you know, as you said uh, before, like we're all kind of scrappy, like there's gonna be things that, that are out there that you can figure it out to, to get through and like maintain everything. And so it's convincing yourself of that and then having those conversations with, with your family about how you're going to, to still uphold your, you know, end of the, the bargain, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Ashley, what do you want to say? Yeah, um, I think that, that's very spot on. Uh, what was your family experience? How did your <clears throat> mom react? Uh, my members? mom is supportive. Uh, she, I think at best, um, my father is also like in the picture, he's just like not as, we're not as close. I don't grow up with him. He like didn't go to school either and he was very like, a little up by your bootstraps, but like the mm -hmm. non-academic way. Um, so he like did well for himself. Uh, but I think it was always like, why are you like, what are you what like, what are you doing? Um, but also like, I was like, I owe nothing to you. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, I owe nothing in a lot of weird ways to like, I can make my own decisions because I'm an adult. So I think, and again, maybe this is that very strong independence thing where I was like, you don't have anything over me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very, again, maybe to some point, like I, and that was to my father and like to my mother, like not less, but also like, it's like, what are you going to say? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I was like, I have like, I am, I am done this all by myself throughout my entire life. I'm mm -hmm. going to continue doing this by myself. But if you have, like, if I have your support, that's better for me. And I did like, like I do have their support, but it wasn't, it wasn't financial, it wasn't, it, it is emotional to an extent, but like I don't tell my mom or my dad anything. Like I had a, yesterday got an offer from a job and we were having a celebration. So I was like, yeah, I immediately like would call my mom after every interview to like tell her exactly how it went. And blah, blah. I was like, oh yeah. And then she's like, what about you? I was like, no, I like never tell my mom I'm doing any of this. Is there a reason? I, they don't understand. Okay. Um, I tried to share with my mom like, oh, I 
doing this or like they don't understand why you're work why you're interviewing for a job when you're in school if you're in inter- they don't understand what an intern they don't understand okay. what this looks like but also at the same time it's like when I was trying to tell her like for instance I was like okay this is the salary of this one job and it's like she's like okay like she's like I'm sorry like I don't know what that means she doesn't have a salary she knows her weekly take-home pay mm-hmm. and I had to make her the math I'm like this is how much you make a month this is how much you make a year this is how much I'm gonna make and it's just like she's like oh like I just can't fathom it so it's again it's a very lonely experience because mm-hmm. you don't have that the same type of like I would love to have, like, a lot of people would chat with their parents about what decisions they should make, even now. Like, a lot of people get financial support from their parents where they pay for everything. I know friends that have their whole rent paid for. Yeah. All their trips are getting paid for. Their parents are MBA graduates. And it's, like, hard not to walk. You don't want to carry that chip. That's right. Yeah. But at the same time, it is, it's, like, you do realize that we real. all have different lines. Like, we all come from different places and we have different lines that we're starting at and I think it is just like being very cognizant of what you have and like what privileges I I'm always very present what privileges I carry and I think that's like a push for others to also be very cognizant of what privileges they have and where there's people that don't have those and the importance of creating access for people to have those opportunities but right and I think it creates more empathy in Mm -hmm. us right as individuals um okay thank you so much for for being open and vulnerable about that can you describe, so you, at a panel recently that I heard you talk on, I was really struck by your describing, um, you know, being life or being low income in first generation as an invisible identity group. Can you talk a little bit about that, maybe share with us so the audience understands? What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's definitely not anything that I, I you know, would have thought existed, right? Because I think there's so many different ways where affinity groups are able to outwardly live, you know, if, if they're in a supportive environment, outwardly live what they identify with. And for us, a lot of that, it's it's an inwardly lived. It's, you know, being scared about money, being worried if you're going to fit in at a business function or if you're going to know the correct terminology. And so it's a lot of inward stuff. And, and that... Um, that identity is not easily recognized by someone else. You know, if, mm-hmm. if I'm, if you pass me in the hallway, uh, or you, uh, you see me on the street, you're not gonna think that, oh well, this guy comes from from this mm-hmm. background. But that background shaped everything that I am, and it still shapes every decision that I make today, to the fullest extent. And it, you know, I, I think it's it's difficult because people will in will make a lot of assumptions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think one of the things th- that that I took home from the panel is that for me, I mean, it was, it was probably just as beneficial for me to do that panel as to do this as it was for maybe people to listen because having that self-realization and talking about it and reminding yourself where it is, because we it is all inward. It's, it's never outward for us. Um, and I, I think it's important to, to, as you think about identities, whether they're invisible or people are living them outward, is that it just takes a little bit of vulnerability that goes both ways to, to try to understand it. And so you can be a vulnerable person, not by outwardly speaking about something, but being willing to listen to what, what these identities are. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be, I think, the key to, to understand this more, but also give people that come from our background the, um, the confidence to, to start living our our identity outwardly instead of just inwardly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Any other thoughts around that in terms of um, how is, has it shown up in, in any of your worlds, Maya? Oh, that was very well said. I <laughs> like my friends. Most of them don't know that I'm a first generation. It's something that's never really talked about. So I do think, yeah, it it would be cool to start living it sort of outward and also like having events like this where you can really talk about it and other people can relate. Mm-hmm and say, oh, you know, there's others. So how would it look if you lived it, if you if it were more known, if it were more visible? What would that look like? What would you feel more comfortable being able to either talk about, do, what, like what does that look when you said it? It's very inward, right? Yeah. And you talked about it, it would be nice to have it be more mm-hmm. visible. How would that manifest itself? What would you be able to do if that you can't do now if you, we're able to talk about it more. 
<laughs> I, I, Good question. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think for me, it's it's you know, especially in in some of these you know classes or just social interactions, like being willing to say, well, what does what does that mean? Okay. Right. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. because you feel like you have to maintain like a pace and a speed with the people that are around you that are coming from, you know. They maybe grew up talking about it or hearing their parents talk about it at the dinner table about what this is or what they're doing or work and, and that's something that I never had and so there's just so many aspects of, of business and even a world with with money that I don't understand like okay well am I doing the right thing to save for retirement like am I doing like are the investment choices I'm making mm -hmm. good investment choices uh, I think oftentimes people don't want to speak up in those scenarios but Again, it's you know money is at the forefront of our mind, so it's often something that we're already thinking about, even in all of these interactions. And so it'd be nice to do that, and it'd just be nice to, you know, to. I think p for people to keep in mind those things when when they're talking about a topic that they they might need to just think about. Oh, when we're going on this trip, uh, you know, sh we should consider you know, the things that we're adding on. Like maybe there's someone that can't afford to do this nine day thing. Like, mm -hmm. can they do like a two or three day thing? Can we ch choose cheaper options uh, so they can still be involved in it mm -hmm. would, would be nice. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things you, you're alluding to are this notion of imposter syndrome mm -hmm. too. You know, has, has anyone experienced it? <laughs> if so, any examples you guys feel comfortable sharing? I mean, I still experience it. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think it's, yeah. it's just kind of hard not to. But anything that comes to mind that you want to talk about? Feel comfortable? Uh, yeah, um, like every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's gotten much better. I think Gary spoke about this during his panel too. Sometimes, like he's vulnerable, and he'll you can share when like, oh, I didn't do very well on this, and like, blah blah blah. And I think sometimes having that moment of like being vulnerable and sharing when you're not don't know everything or don't have all the answers, but there's a lot of confidence in business school. <laughs> like a lot of people are very confident in themselves and it's great, like you want to be. Um, but I think sometimes it could also come with like at the expense of making others feel like they are not there and that they don't belong. belong. And so I have felt that and I think part of my, I loved earlier you mentioned about giving grace to yourself and I have gotten really comfortable with that. Okay. Giving grace to yourself because again, why should I go into class knowing everything? Like I don't have business in my background. I did not do this in undergrad. I did not do this for the last six, seven years like a lot of other people did. Why would I be able to do a case as well as some of these people that have been doing this for months or years? It doesn't make sense and it's not good for me to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not good on my mental health to like be comparing myself to right. others right. that again might have had different Lived experiences. experiences. And, yeah. yeah, and maybe had other again, like there's different starting lines. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we uh, that makes me very much like want to double down on like the I mean ensuring that we're creating equitable experiences for people mm -hmm. um, and finding ways to mitigate those inequities that exist during especially in higher education especially in the workplaces um, and I think that's been like a big reason of like why is because I want to help others feel like they can combat this like imposter syndrome because we really do belong here and I think I have to tell myself that all the time like I was like you got into six MBA programs mm -hmm. you got offers of consulting firms like you did your thing like you did this and like yeah I'm still like I don't think I'm gonna get this I don't think I deserve this I don't think I really should have this like there's people that are better than me um, and it just doesn't make sense for myself to talk to myself in that way anymore so I think it's really like a conscious decision every day to tell yourself like I give belong. yourself grace That's I belong right. mm -hmm. but also like it yeah, helps okay. having a circle and friends and feeling supported by your peers and your professors or those new mentors. And I think that's been something that I've been granted through Fuqua um, that I'm very glad about, that I've found those networks. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, like you guys mentioned, like being able to educate others about the small microaggressions that might happen mm -hmm. that make others feel uncomfortable yeah. or as if they you know, don't belong or this sense of imposter syndrome unknowingly unintentionally but there are things that we can all do and I'll we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of what you feel 
either FUQA could be doing more your, or your classmates could be doing more uh, along the way. Um, you know, I'm going to ask for maybe a, a more upbeat example. So, you know, we're known for Team FUQA. Everyone out there knows that. <laughs> uh, any examples of Team FUQA and how it's played out in the context of your lived experience? Something maybe that delighted you, surprised you, um, that, you know, really meant, demonstrated the Team FUQA sense and culture? Um, but as it relates to kind of being either, you know, first gen or, mm -hmm. or from a lower socioeconomic background. I could start. Um, <clears throat> one of the first events, like as a whole section for the MMS program was we got together and they put a bunch of identities up on the board. And we sort of got to choose like our six core identities. Um, and, you know, they really told us like you can get vulnerable, really, you know, choose identities that you want your sort of new um, classmates to know about, which is hard because you're just meeting everyone and, you know, you kind of want to create this image for yourself. But people got like pretty deep and, you know, I put first generation on there oh, and it sparked like some awesome conversations and I met other first generation students. Um, so it's such a nice way to like connect with others. Um, but that's something that really comes to mind when I think of like your identities. and. And being embraced, right? Yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. part of Team Fuqua. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else have an example? Yeah, I think uh, if you probably asked people that knew me a year ago, they'd say Garrett is not a vulnerable person. He's not. <laughs> he doesn't uh, live that out. Okay. Um, but the environment that's here at Fuqua, like, allows me to be in it, allows me to, to live it out because mm -hmm. I think the best part about about it is everyone wants to be your friend, right? Like, I know that just based off of a couple interactions uh, before now, like, I could walk by Ashton in the hallway and easily pick up a conversation, or if I see her out at a restaurant or bar or whatever else, like, like you'll never go anywhere that people don't want you to be there. Mm -hmm. And you'll never go anywhere where you don't know someone or recognize someone. And that's really helpful in, and people wanting to be your friend and wanting to get to know you and allowing you to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, kind of like I was saying before, like it's it's just, I think, as important for, for us to to talk about it outwardly as it is for people to, to hear it. Because uh, it helps us, I think, you know, come to grips with, with uh, where we've gotten because of, because of the background. Right, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna ask um, maybe, um, Ashlyn, you know, is there anything that, any initiatives that you see um, that might be helpful for us as an institution to think about um, or support, you know, uh, the, either in the represent, growing the representation of more individuals who are from first generation experiences and or support that would be helpful during your student experience? What, what can people be doing better? Yeah, um, so uh, I mentioned life a lot. Uh, life is a new club. Um, so we had our first flagship event two weeks ago, a panel. Gary was on the panel, as along with four other peers mm -hmm. in the FUCA programs. And I think it was important because that was the first time we've had that conversation maybe. Like, oh, I think there have been some during dialogues before that. But this is like the first, this group exists, we had about, 80, 90 people show up, maybe. I'm, it was a great turnout. Yeah, yeah. great turnout. Um, again, a little bit of that Team Fuqua, like I feel like I reached out to, and I saw a lot of turnout from people that I felt really close to, and that made me really, felt felt like nice that people were coming out to support, um, mm -hmm. especially at our first event on an evening. <laughs> uh, but um, I think one is really supporting and amplifying the work that life is doing, and like the as we're kind of getting geared up. We're one of the only MBA programs that really has this kind of group existing, uh, where we see more movement happening in the undergraduate space. But in the master's programs, again, there's a lot of acad higher academics, academia has work to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say the workplace also has work to do. So those, this affinity group does not exist in a lot of workplaces. Right. So one thing that we struggle with is like we're creating this community here, and then we're going to go out and be alone again. Mm. And so a big push um, for like our PD cabinet uh, <laughs> is that we want to like start having those conversations and we need Fuqua and other MBA programs to also have those conversations with workplaces and career mm -hmm. like similarly saying oh we know this is important we're pulling and trying to 
you know, we want more of these students to come here. We're gonna, we're at 80 right mm -hmm. now, 80 out of um, maybe 90 out of a total class of 700 to 800 folks. So that's a lot. Um, but we need the academic institutions to also be supporting us and ensuring that we're amplifying our mission and our vision and that we, what we create here also is able to like hopefully manifest itself once we leave here. Right. Because that's, yeah, yeah, like we want the space and we want a continued space to, um, so what I think that's a big effort is in the career aspect and the support. I think also identifying that we have different conversations to have within our group. Like we experience negotiations differently. Like we were talking about how life members are more likely to make about 30K less than their peers mm -hmm. because we don't know how to negotiate salaries because we don't have that. This, we don't understand them in the same way that somebody who has social or capital networks understands those. So I think it's like, again, just really when you're, and there's been a lot of points where I feel like I've tried to, like I like have to call administration out and be like, oh, like, are you just, a, like this is, how are we, how is this affecting life people? And I think just like kind of constantly having that awareness and getting that, building that understanding to catch those missing points in your view and mm -hmm. like you're not thinking of, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, try to not use. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, trying to like miss those, mm -hmm. um, your missed opportunities. Yeah. And so making sure when we're not in those spaces that we're being brought into those spaces and being like talked to in ways that it's like, okay, how do we make sure we have the first gen or the low-income student experience available represented in, in the rooms and spaces mm -hmm. where decisions are being made um, yeah. from an academic per or from an admissions perspective. We're meeting with you next in a few days to talk about how we can support prospective students more and be more mm -hmm. intentional. Similarly, how other affinity groups have events for them. Like I think we're at a point where we want to also build affinity group space yeah. for us, and we also want to have more of these conversations and opportunities to really connect and chat. And again, mm -hmm. it's been the biggest barrier to me accessing this point and so I want to make sure that we continue to create accessibility for future candidates. Yeah no same here so we're very excited about that conversation coming up. Uh, Gary similar question but geared towards your classmates so what as an ally or anyone out there who's interested in being an ally to someone who identifies as either first gen or low income um, background what what can what can we do as allies? Yeah. better so I, I think it's you know it, it is one of those things where naturally people here are are good allies in a lot of ways because they're willing to to listen which is you know what I was saying and so it, it's just being willing to listen like being willing to take it in and being being willing to uh, maybe not understand but try to understand like that that's like if you show effort into understanding what my background is and you know that it affects the decisions then we're going to be on the same page more times than not. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just it's just talking about it and being willing to talk about it is, is the biggest thing. You know, there's there's not you know too many things um, that I think can physically be done uh, as as allies in this space because mm -hmm. we do internalize a lot of it. Um, but just identifying yourself as as someone that you know you can ask that you know maybe dumb question to. Um, for a, for someone that comes from a life background, hey, what is what does this mean? Or or hey, what you know, what did this company offer you? Um, how much should I be asking for? Just just identifying yourself as being willing to talk and being willing to listen, I think is, is one of the best ways to be an ally and, and, and just um, leading with kindness in, mm -hmm. in all ways. Not judging. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I add on something? Go ahead. <laughs> There's also there's a lot of uh, after that panel, we had a lot of feedback from students, like from like students being like, we use meet like thank you so much for sharing this, but also like wanting to support. So a lot of other prof club oh, okay. uh, people that lead all the professional clubs, a lot of people were like, hey, can we do a financial, like can we have something for you on like um, understanding like how to do investments, and can we have something about like understanding like maybe the different like at this point what financial literacy looks like. Like, can we do a workshop? Like, we, we, we have a contact that we work with and we want to do this workshop for life. So I think, like, even that is a form of allyship. Like, people mm -hmm. just, like, reaching out or, like, being like, hey, we want to have a speaker series. We want to make sure we're targeting life alumni. Can right. you help us get life alum? So there's also something to increasing the visibility yeah. of this experience and, like, being very conscious, again, like, when we're not in the space, how do you bring us into the space? So I think the, I, the idea of partnerships and wanting to like 
even support us because they're like, this is valuable and this is important. And what what things do I know that can be of support to y'all? Um, and I think there's like a lot of amazing opportunities now, like with the, I was like pitching something, but like the trucks, when people go on trucks for IV or trucks for consulting, I was like, hey, we have a lot of local stuff. Can we do local trucks somewhere? Like, yeah. that's one of my initiatives with the PD, like, Professional development. Yeah, yeah. yeah. professional development, sorry, <laughs> clubs, is for them to think about. And, like, I think they're very willing to do that. Um, right. It also helps that a lot of the members are spread out because our members are insanely cool. Um, so they're in all these clubs and, like, a lot of co-presidents are okay. actually the MBA co-presidents. Um, and then I'm going to pivot a little bit because I know we're running out of town a little bit. But and So, Mia, talk a little bit about... Um, you know, one piece of advice maybe that you would give to an undergraduate student who uh, identified as either from a low-income socioeconomic background or first generation, mm -hmm. and but was interested in, in applying to business school, what advice would you share with them? Yeah, I mean, just the advice of like work hard and don't limit your dreams because as we've talked about, there's so many opportunities but also resources and so many people there to support you. Um, such as clubs and professors, and there's a whole network of people that are cheering for you. Um, and that's something that I've realized even from being here for the last three months only, um, mm -hmm. that I'm really appreciative of, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, working hard is, is something that that's I think the, is a yeah. theme, right? Yeah. Um, working hard, working smart, work, you know, yeah. but also, like you said, having the resources, having the support um, is important as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, because why should you work as any harder than anyone else, right? Yes. So having those uh, opportunities, I think, is important as well. Uh, Gary, for you, um, what, what do you plan on doing this summer? Uh, so hopefully get an internship uh, at, you know. What do you want to do? Uh, so I'm recruiting for consulting. Okay. Um, so trying to, to find the, the best fit in a location that allows me to do, be a good co-parent and uh, mm -hmm. you know, supportive of, of all of the things is, is really the, the biggest goal. Uh, so, uh, a good company and send a um, good location. Okay. And you'll take a lot of the things that, well, you know, you're getting from life and you're going to take those into Absolutely. your summer internship? Okay. Um, Ashton, for you, did you learn anything or take anything from your first year experience into your internship that really helped you either from a confidence perspective, reducing imposter syndrome, you know, any of the skills and resources that you've you know, found, built, developed, already had coming in that you found to be helpful? Yeah. In your <laughs> um, I think it was really important to kind of be willing to, like, ask for help is always there. Uh, I think we don't ask for help very much sometimes, I think, because you're so used to figuring it out on your own. Mm -hmm. But the need, and, like, especially in a very quick, like, you only have 10 weeks, you can only do so much, so you have to be willing to ask for help and finding those support structures of people who are willing to support you um, is really of the essence. So I think those were two things that I learned that I had to start to make sure that I was finding in my internship as I was navigating and pivoting to com commercial okay. corporate work. Yep. It was very different. Um, so I said those were like probably just two things that I had to be willing to do and open to do, but at the same time also kind of staying very authentic to who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that was something that I could not shy away from. And I also found out it was not a good fit for me because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I need, I am who I am and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make myself smaller like for anyone. be authentic. I'm not gonna space. make myself smaller right. for anyone. Right. And so exactly. I think that's like very much something that I yeah. carry with me and I wanna, making sure to find that wherever I Excellent. go. Excellent, Excellent. You touched a lot about kind of your vision for life, what the programming, you know, you're planning to offer. Um, what we didn't touch on is the name. Mm -hmm. So why low income and first gen? What's the significance of that? Yeah, very intersectional group. Um, I think we wanted also to be very cognizant. Uh, first generation sometimes gets very, in the US construct, it can mean first generation immigrant or first generation student. Mm -hmm. So I do want to be very clear, we're trying to Pull that out. It's for first generation, uh, like academic students. higher yeah. academic students. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to sometimes because in U.S. construct we've identified those as the same. Like we put the yeah. same name title, so yeah. that gets confusing. Mm -hmm. um, low income. We also realize that not every single person who maybe 
is a first, like some people are not first generation. Well, actually, a lot of our students are not that are in the club. A lot of them just grew up from very low income background. And this also is very a very important nuance for international candidates. Mm -hmm. A lot of international candidates do have like a parent that goes similarly here, like one of our members is um, his parents were both school teachers in the South. You, you know what a school teacher's salary in the South is. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot. Uh, so it's like you don't, you still had the similar like Experience, experiences, experience. Yeah. at least like of growing up with yeah. a very, like of not having this like social capital that mm -hmm. comes with like, uh, that we're kind of talking or alluding to. Gotcha. So we think it's important to make sure that this group is encompassing of either having both or at least identifying with one and we want to make sure that this is still like a space that we can have those conversations and like I think the students who are maybe not both are very like willing to like understand and learn and like they're very like I didn't have that experience and like I'm listening I'm learning mm -hmm. and are honestly more willing probably to empathize a bit more yeah. Um, but yeah that's why we did that excellent yeah that that's a great point you know um, and it's a very inclusive Point, right, mm -hmm. it really cuts through various intersectionalities, which, yeah. I, which I really appreciate. Man, we could talk about this <laughs> on and on and on. Really, um, it's a very robust topic. It's a very important topic. You know, um, I, I think I mentioned it, over twenty percent of our student body across all of our programs are identified as first generation, and so it's a very important. Um, a diverse population for us in, 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 in student experience for us um, that I think uh, I hope that the audience is, um, has been um, excited to learn more about uh, especially each of your three unique experiences it's also these are also experiences are very unique there's not one monolithic experience of being um, first generation or low income and so I really appreciate each and every one of you your ability and willingness to be open, to be candid, to be vulnerable, and to share, right? And so I've really enjoyed, I've really learned a lot from each of you, and I hope that our audience has, has as well. So thank you, and uh, thank all, each of you out there for joining us and for listening in. Hopefully it was an enlightening conversation. You have a better appreciation for the breadth and depth of the first generation student community here at Fuqua. Um, and I hope that you'll join us uh, for our next uh, session, which is on mental health being, mental wellness and health um, and well-being. And that is on December, in December the 13th, Why Mental Health Matters at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hopefully you'll join us right back here for another session of Blue Table Talks. In the meantime, I hope everyone out there has a wonderful day. I hope each of our panelists do as well. And again, I thank everyone for making the time for such an important topic. So see you guys all later. Bye. Bye. Bye.